Civ Group. The concept is simple. Civ Group selects, trains, and puts citizens through realistic missions and training, overseen by elite special operations and intelligence professionals, to prepare you for anything that life could throw at you. Their missions were secret. Now they are bringing their knowledge to you on how to live prepared for anything. Train for the real world with the people who have lived life's most dangerous missions and follow them as they show you how to be ready for your own. The Team House with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. So I ended up doing all that, and then other things started happening. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Yemen. Um, we've, you know, we've kind of talked about that in another episode. But basically, while I was here, um, so the same company I was working for in Hong Kong, they're friends of mine. Um, I worked for them in South Africa, Mexico. You know, I did a lot of stuff for them, contracting as a consultant, security consultant, bodyguard, et cetera. So, so here's the story out. So I'll go yeah, ahead and yeah. cut right into this one. This was kind of cool. Um, so one night I'm in South Africa, sitting around the pool with a guy, um, the owner, his name, we'll call him AG. And uh, AG is a pretty freaking hardcore, no shit kind of guy, man. Um, he either likes you or he don't. If he don't like you, he'll let you know about it too. Um, and so luckily I was, you know, I was good friends with this guy and, and uh, got along just fine with him. So we're in South Africa sitting around the pool one night and he's like, Dale, he goes, um, he goes, how come you do all these other things? You know, why don't you just focus on security and, you know, you could be really good at that and make a lot of money, you know, why do you do this and do that? Because at the time I was like teaching as a professor for Henley Putnam University. I'm a journeyman. I just travel around doing weird jobs, right? Like going to Singapore and trading dogs. <laughs> um, and I told him, I said, well, you know, I said, you know, I said, <laughs> I said, I got a lot of ex-wives out there that need to get paid, you know, <laughs> freaking parasites, man, you know, I'm, I've got to, I got to pay them off all the time, you know, I got a lot of kids and shit, you know, and so I said, I go where the work is, I make my money, I said, I'm pretty happy because I get to travel, I get to do different things, I wear a different hat every day, and so it's not so bad. And he looks at me, he goes, man, he goes, what if I gave you fifty thousand dollars cash? He goes, would that help you? And I thought about it. I was like, yeah, of course it would help me, but I'm not taking it. And uh, he wanted to give me $50,000 cash because he thought it would relieve some pressure, right? <clears throat> and so that I could focus on just, you know, security, for example. And I said, no, I said, you know what? I, said, I can't accept your money. I said, I don't take money I don't earn. And so we kind of got an argument over the swimming pool, around the swimming pool. And he's like, well, he goes, tell me, Dale. He goes, you've done so much in your life. What's next? What are you going to do next? And I looked at him, I go, I want to be like you. He looks at me like, I go, what? And I go, yeah, I want to be like you. I want to be some rich guy sitting around a fucking pool asking people what they're going to do with their lives, you right. know, and <laughs> giving them $50,000. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, so we ended up parting ways that night, went to our rooms, and the next morning, his partner calls me to the office, and uh, he goes, hey, AG left uh, this morning, went back home, but, you know, he just put um, $50,000 in your bank account. And I was like, what the hell, man? And so he goes, you can't give it back. We're not taking it back. We don't want it back. He goes, listen, he goes, other people have helped us. Other veterans have come up and helped us when we needed it. And he goes, we want to do the same thing, you know? And uh, I said, well, I appreciate all that. But I said, I don't work for free. So I said, count, count this as paying. You've paid this forward. So next time you have a project, I said, you call me. I'll drop what I'm doing. I'll come here wherever and go to work for you, right? You get your money back. So that wasn't even enough, man. Then he put me on a $7,000 a month retainer for the next six months. I'm like, damn. So I'm making, I'm doing all right. And, um, and so then I leave and I end up going back to Indonesia. I start my security business here. Um, my wife and I are not married yet, but uh, we start this enterprise. And then one day I'm flying back to the U.S. and I get a text message from AG. He goes, hey, man, I need to talk to you about some security related stuff. This was over a year later, a year and a half later. And I thought, Man, you know, I'm got my own security business, this is conflict of interest. I really wasn't interested at this point. I was excited about starting my own company here. So I get to the States, he texts me again, he goes, I really, really need to talk to you, but I can't talk to you over the phone. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, AGF, you know, I'm him and a ha. And he goes, Okay, listen, he goes, I'm gonna buy your plane ticket to San Diego. He goes, When you get here, I'm gonna pay you six thousand dollars for three hours of your time. 
I got to, you got to listen to me. I shit. Okay. <laughs> it must be important. So I fly out there. He's leaning up against this badass freaking Porsche at the airport. I show up. He hands me an envelope with $6,000 cash. And he's like, get in bitch. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we take off. Right. And, uh, we end up in his neighborhood, which was pretty amazing. Um, I mean, he literally, he lived next door to Bill Gates and a whole bunch of other people. I'm like, holy shit, dude, this guy's rolling in dough. And he was, um, so that evening we had a, you know, we sat down, we had dinner and he and his partner told me what the plan was. Right. And so basically it was, they had a contract with the Emiratis and, uh, basically to take out their HPTs, right. They need a special forces capability. They didn't have it. Um, AG promised them that we could deliver this. And so, you know, I'm okay. Yeah. Roger that sounds like a good idea. Pretty cool. But you know, I'm going back to Indonesia in three days and, uh, I really didn't want to go. And so he already threw $40,000 cash on the table in front of me. He goes, that's yours. All right. And I'm like, look, dude, I go, I said, I said, you do the first one. I said, I'll come in for the fall on evolutions. I just got to go home, you know, see my, my girl and kind of, you know, I'm not, I wasn't ready for this shit, you know? And he goes, no, if I don't, if I can't have you for the first one, I don't need you for the other ones. And so I'm like, damn, okay. And I said, all right, okay, okay, I'm in, right? So, <laughs> so I fly home. I said, I got to go to Indonesia first though. So I literally, the next morning I fly to Indonesia. I see my wife, my girl, um, I lied to her. I said, look, I'm going to go to the Middle East. I'm doing some consulting, you know, security consulting work, you know, make a little bit of money. Be right back. No danger. Problem. Be right back. Oh, okay. So they tell me don't bring any equipment. You don't need it. It's already provided for you. Right. Oh, okay. So I fly, I fly from Jakarta all the way to uh, New York, LaGuardia. Um, I check into a hotel as I'm supposed to. I'm waiting around downstairs in the lounge area, restaurant area having a beer and I noticed there's a bunch of French dudes walking around. They all look pretty fit, you know, but they're French. And so I get a little suspicious. And then I had to be up in a hotel room around 1030 that night. We all had to meet there. Okay. We all were given instructions at this time, meet this room. So I show up in there and there's all these French dudes are standing there. There's 11 of us total. Um, you know, AG is partner of seal, um, me. And then, uh, the other, uh, the French, they're French foreign legionnaires is what they are. And so we're all standing there looking at each other like, who's who, you know, like the movie Ronin. And then, uh, AG's like, all right, guys, here's the play. Here's the mission. Here's the plan. He goes, this is what we're going to go do. He goes, if you're not interested, he goes, you can keep the $20,000 I gave you and just leave right now. And no questions asked, go back home. I'm like, fuck man. So everybody got 20, 20 grand, except for me, I had 40 grand, <laughs> but I had to tell nobody. Well, there was a reason I got 40 grand and I was about to find that out in a second. So nobody quit. He goes, okay, good. He goes, welcome aboard. He goes, so, and then he points at me and he tells everybody in the room, he goes, that guy's in charge of everything. He's the boss. Whatever he says goes, you do what he tells you to do. Everything. I'm like, what? <laughs> me? <laughs> so, you know, I don't even know what the hell's going on here right now. And I'm in charge, right? All of a sudden <laughs> of everything and literally everything. And, uh, all right. So the next day, um, we have to meet downstairs, uh, in the evening, we get on a bus, um, a bunch of vans and we go to Teterboro. Uh, it's a private airport, uh, airport up there. And uh, he tells us to make sure we're wearing all our tactical gear, our uniforms. That's kind of weird. It's a business fucking airport. Everybody's wearing suits and we show up wearing <laughs> camouflage right. and beards and shit, right? But he had a reason for it. Okay, he had a reason for it. And the reason was he knew people were watching us. People very high up were watching us. Okay. And so he wasn't, he didn't want to hide anything. He didn't want to give the illusion that we're not up to something. He wanted to make it really clear that, yeah, we're doing this and I'm not going to hide it. So we show up to the airport that night, a G five shows up. We load it with food and water, our gear, no weapons. Um, and we take off and we fly. I think we did our first fuel stop, uh, in Hungary. And, uh, and then we continued on. And so the pilots and the, flight attendants, they had no idea where we're going, right? They got their initial grid coordinates. And then in flight from Hungary, we gave them a change of, uh, change the flight plan on said, okay, this is your coordinates. This is where you put an airplane down, which was in the desert on a dirt airstrip, complete remote, not even on a map. We're like they're right here's an airstrip on this grid. Can I just put your airplane there? 
And I what? And said, just do it. And he, yes, sir. Be back. They didn't even question it, man. <laughs> so they're like, whatever you guys want, man. You know, uh, we're doing it. So we ended up landing in the middle of an airfield. There was, if you want to call it, it's just a strip, just a dirt right, strip. Right. There's nothing there, nothing, um, except one C-130 sitting there uh, with the ramp down engines running. That was the only thing that was sitting there. So we land in G-5. We unload our shit. We walk over to the to the ramp. There's a colonel waiting for us. as an intel uh, officer. Um, and the Emirati military? And, yeah, Emirati, right? So he's checking the block as we're getting on. You know, we're loading all our shit in the back, and then uh, we take off. And we fly about another four hours to uh, Djibouti. We land, get off, and there's a CH-47 and two H-6 helicopters sitting there, engines running, waiting for us. So we transload into those things, take off, fly about another hour. We end up in Aden, Yemen. Uh, at one of their fobs out there. And so we, you know, at this, at this point, it's like two o'clock in the morning, uh, 2 a.m. And uh, I asked the intel officer, I go, hey, uh, where's all our gear, all the weapons, all the shit that's supposed to be waiting for us? Because, oh, it's on the way. And so they had set up a couple of GP mediums uh, uh, in a containment area within the fob. Nobody knew we were there. They intentionally tried to make sure we were hidden, you know. And so he said, will be here shortly, right? So this shows up, all these pickup trucks full of garbage, literally fucking garbage, you know, like pieces and parts of weapon systems, um, just shit, man. I mean, like, what the hell? And so they're unloading all this crap, you know, and uh, we got DSHK with no fuck, no tripods. We've got, you know, we've got no magazines for the AK-47s. we got no links for the PKMs, you know. And, oh, by the way, we're supposed to be getting all U.S. mill equipment, brand new. And they're giving us this 30-year-old Chicom rusty bullshit, right? <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm inventorying it, and I'm looking at it, and I realize, ain't nothing we can do with this. Nothing functional. Nothing's operational. So I walk up to him, to the colonel. I go, hey, sir. I said, this ain't going to work. I said, we're missing everything, right? We're missing all the pieces and parts. And he, he hated the fact that we were coming in to fight his war. Mm-hmm. He hated the fact that they didn't have the capability, right? He he despised us. And I said, sir, I said, well, this is not, you know, this is not going to get it. And he looks at me with his hands on his hips. He goes, so what you're telling me is you can't do the mission. I'm like, no, I didn't say I couldn't do the mission. I killed the guys with a damn spoon, but I can do the mission. I would really like to have some weapons though, you know, where I can shoot from a distance, you know? And, uh, and so I gave him a little, you know, piece of my mind. I confronted him and, and he's like, okay, okay. I said, by the way, where's all my American weapons at? That we're supposed to get, right? I know what he did. He took that money and put it in his freaking pocket. Right, he did. right. Yeah, that's what he did, right, little son of a bitch. Um, and he went down to the local bazaar and bought us all this crap, right? And so, anyways, I kind of gave him the stink guy. He got the message. He came and I gave him the shortage list. He came back with uh, the pieces and parts we were missing. Basically, we were just cobbling weapons together and, you know, improvising uh, everything. There were no uniforms. Um, nothing, man. So I'm, I'm literally got, you know, a pair of 511s on, some desert boots. Um, I had on a, a, a tank top for, for the gym. I actually had weight training gloves. Those are my tactical gloves. You know, I was, we were making it up as we go, man. We're literally like making our own freaking, you know, vests and stuff for ammo and stuff, you know, knitting and shit, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? So we literally improvised everything we had to go do these operations. Um, because we got no tactical gear. They, they just they didn't give it to us, and I think it was because he wanted us to fail. Is what it was. Right. But we were <clears throat> we weren't having that. So um, the and next question how, was okay. Tar- go ahead. How old were you at this point, Dale? So this was uh, 2015, 2016. Um, so you basically uh, what six years ago? I'm 59. So I was about 53. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's yeah. nice. It's it's nice to know though that a tiger doesn't change its stripes. Dale. I, I find I find that comforting about you. <laughs> <laughs> no man, actually I was leading the charge, man. I was in good shape as anybody there or better, um, you know. And there was a reason I was in charge mm-hmm. because I, I learned that lesson later on too. It's like okay, now I know why I'm here. <laughs> but uh, so, anyways, uh, we got the target list. Um, it was long, over 40 people on the list, spread across three countries. Um, so we were going to be doing some globe trotting. Um, to go take these guys out, but they were all HPTs. Uh, it was not a capture mission. It was a kill mission. That was it. Uh, these guys had to go. They're all bad guys. They're all terrorists. Um, they're all associated or affiliated with Al-Qaeda. 
uh, particularly Al Qaeda, Arabic Peninsula, ACAP, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, ISIS, Houthis. Um, there are a lot of bad guys there. And, which, uh, which, is, which three countries? I, I can't say the other two countries. <laughs> okay. Just say they were on the African continent. So, so, <laughs> so, does, we, so because you're saying like um, AQ Arab Peninsula, did the UAE? which is a fairly, I mean, in terms of Arabic countries, it's like a fairly liberal country. Um, mm. Did, did it, and I don't mean liberal politically, I just mean liberal in terms of, of like yeah. religion and whatnot. Yeah. Do, do they have a different HVT set than say the United States does and that their concerns, even though these people are AQ or ISIS, but their concerns are different because these H, uh, high value targets, the HVTs, are operating directly against like the Emirates and in places like that. Yeah, so exactly, they got their own their their target list may be different from our target list. Some of them, not all of them, um, and they had their own agenda. In fact, the reason we got hired by the MOD because he's the guy that uh, hired us um, was actually a Palestinian and uh, very prominent guy, not even Emirati. Um, but because of a friend of a friend of a friend, he got put into the MOD position. <laughs> um, and so there's a, there's actually a very interesting story about this guy on that. His name is Mohammed Dalin. Um, you can look him up on the internet. Uh, very interesting guy, very cool guy, actually. Um, but very interesting. And, uh, he's, he was not what you would expect. Um, but, um, so anyways, uh, you know, the target list was long, spread over three countries. Um, we needed to get this one. They wanted this one guy in particular right off the bat. He's number target number one. And we're like, okay, uh, what's the deal with this guy? And, you know, and they explained to us, you know, why he's a threat. Um, okay, he's a, he's a shady character. He's, he was actually from India. He was not Arabic. He was India, but he was Muslim, and he was a pedophile. Um, and he's homosexual. He had all kinds of weird shit going on too, but he was very well trained in trade craft and street craft. So he never put his head down in the same place twice. Um, he had his own security detail. Um, he was being financed, um, as I understand it, by the Muslim Brotherhood and others. He was using Al Qaeda as an action arm. Um, just a lot of weird things going on, right? So supposedly this guy won the Nobel Prize, blah, blah, blah. It's all bullshit. OK, because one of the things I made sure of that I insisted on was any targets that we take out, we got to I got to be convinced this guy's a bad guy and it's just not some little personal agenda. Right. Right. Um, this is guy has got to be a legit target. So we did our due diligence, you know, and we investigated closely. It's like, OK, this guy's he's the real deal. Um, so we green lighted him. Um, but what was interesting was as we're going through this target list, we're, we're developing the first target. Took us a couple of weeks, which actually was pretty fast, considering we had no uh, human uh, human sources. We had nothing to work with. I mean, we're gleaning information off the internet. You know, we're bribing the Emiratis to give us some intel. They were trying to, what's the word I'm looking for? They were trying to remain hands off. They wanted to have plausible deniability. right? <laughs> yeah, right. And so we're like, hey, dude, we're never gonna get this done if you're not helping us. You know. So they ended up getting us some sources. Um, you know, we ended up paying them a bunch of money, you know, it makes a bunch of promises and stuff like that. But, uh, in this process, we realized on this list was a guy who was the, uh, the mastermind behind the USS coal bombing. And he was running a madrasa in Aden and he was running a pipeline for ISIS fighters. This guy was a shithead still. And he was there. And we're like, Oh, oh, oh we, we, this is, this is number one. We're going after that guy first, you know, and he's right down the road. And uh, he's really got no security. His house is across the corner, catty corner to his madrasa, where he's running this pipeline, you know, for ISIS fighters and stuff. And so we really wanted that guy. Okay, he's the USS Cold Bomb, you know, mastermind. We were told no. Said no. No, you work for us. This is number one right here. This guy here, you guys can have him later on. <laughs> like, fuck, man. Uh, we really wanted this guy. He would have been an easy target, too. But uh, we, didn't get, we didn't get the shot at him uh, that we wanted. So, um, so long story short, my job was, um, besides, you know, planning execution, um, I realized really quickly that the guys that were with me didn't know what the hell they were doing. So they had no idea about explosives. They didn't know how to use explosives. Um, in fact, I had to show, actually I had to show one of the guys was a seal. 
literally how to put an AK-47 in action. He had no idea how to load it and charge it. It's like, fuck, dude, you know? And so this was a SEAL, too. Um, and, but he was a good guy. I'm not going to take nothing from him. He just didn't know what he was doing. But right. he turned out to be actually one of the better guys out of the bunch because his head was in the right place. Um, the other tur- the other SEAL was a total turd, though, complete turd. Um, so now I'm training these guys on how to basically set headspace and timing on a 50 caliber machine gun, run PKM machine guns, you know, all the weapon systems we have. And then the mission came down. It's like, we might have to hit this guy on the way to the airport. There's only one flight a day leaving Aiden. And, uh, and we had intel that this guy might try to get on that airplane on one of these particular days. And so what we were going to do is ambush him at the airport. Now, what was interesting is the Emirati military occupied the airport. But all the access roads, all the gates going into the airport were manned by Al Qaeda. Mm-hmm. Right? So they control the gates. Right. And, uh, and so we would literally have to drive to the gates, wave at Mr. Al Qaeda, you know, and then go inside into the compound. But they had one flight a day. And we thought this guy's going to get on one of these flights. So we just started planning okay, we got to hit him. We picked out the checkpoint location where we're going to, where we're going to smack him. Um, they thought, well, what if he doesn't come this way? What if he goes that way? And then we thought, okay. Let's ambush him in the vehicle. He's running a small motorcade, thin skin trucks. Um, then the question was, can, who can ride a motorcycle? I'll be damned. I'm the only guy that can ride a motorcycle. I said, are you kidding me? I'm the only guy that can ride a goddamn motorcycle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I'm, you know, I'm doing it all, man. I'm like, what, why, why are you guys even here? I said, right. I might as well just do everything. You know, <laughs> I got to ride the motorcycle. I got to build the IEDs. You know, I got AG on the back of the motorcycle. He's going to hang my IED off the mirror of this truck while we're driving and then vaporize the vehicle with the guy in it. Right. So we got all these contingency plans and, and I'm starting to realize really quickly that I'm the only guy who knows what the hell is going on. I'm the <laughs> only guy who's got any tactical experience to execute this thing, you know. And uh, going back to Discovery Channel, I guess I am a one-man army. So, um, so, so, so anyways, um, so we had all these contingency plans, man. And, there's, you know, we would do all kinds of stuff, man. And it kept changing every day because the guy never slept in the same place twice. So we had to keep adjusting the mission profile, right? Okay, now we're instead of doing motorcycles, we're doing helicopters. Okay, we're not doing helicopters, now we're walking, you know? And so, so finally we, um, we finally got some good intel one night and we had about an hour and a half to spin up because the guy was staying downtown in an office um, and he wasn't gonna come out. We had eyes on, he went watching the guy reporting back to us. We had a drone helicopter up, um, you know, video on the, on the office. We know he was in there. He went in there with his bodyguards um, and his, uh, his assistant, and he had to come out. So we, we were staged, already ready to go, and uh, that's when we went in. And it was only – it was actually five of us that went in out of the team. And out of the five of us, one of them was an Arab. Um, he's, a, he's one of their majors in the military, and he was just the driver. It's like, look, you just drive. You don't touch the guns. Don't play with the fucking radio. Just drive. That's all you got to do, right? And so, and and me and and the AG the, and the two SEALs were in the back of this uh, up armored uh, Land Cruiser, and the job was to literally pull up to the office. I was going to get out, put an IED on the building, and bring it down on top of this guy's head. And uh, so that was the basic plan. And so we roll in. It's I think it's about nine thirty at night. Very dark, um, very dark. You had people on the streets drinking chai. You know, very narrow roads, um, very congested. And um, so we go rolling in at about three miles an hour. That was top speed. You know, I literally got, as the car comes to a stop, I've got Al Qaeda looking in the window, trying to see who's inside the window. And I'm putting a muzzle in his face, getting ready to let the air out of him. <laughs> and um, so finally we get in front of the, the office and it's like, go. <laughs> Doors come open. The first guy shot is the driver. The only guy without a weapon, he gets shot in the fucking leg. Um, and then the rest of us bail out. I grab my charge and I run across the street, run in front of the office door. And I tried to open the door first. My gut, my, I was going to try to open the door, throw a couple of hand grenades in there, and then just go in there and shoot everybody. But they had locked the door from the inside because the bodyguards, usually they sat out in front. But at night, they would roll inside. They would lock the doors up and they would sit right behind the, the, the doors, were these big steel doors. So uh, I couldn't get the door open. So I knew they were in there. They locked it. And so I thought, okay, the only other choice I have now is the place's uh, IED that I built. 
um, in front of the uh, the door. So the, the charge was I, I filled an ammo can with C4 and I filled it up with uh, armor plating from an MRAP. So I basically made it the mother of all claymores. <laughs> and, uh, you know, added some extra honor for the P factor. So I had a little <laughs> nuclear weapon is what I had. And it was all directional. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and so um, I placed the charge. There's a raging gunfight going on right now. Um, and I'm by myself. So for whatever reason, I don't know why, but AG ran up the fucking road like with his hair on fire. And he's shooting it out with people up the street. And he's actually supposed to be with me at the door pulling security for me because I got my hands full. And same thing with the other guy, the other SEAL. He doesn't follow me to the door either. He stays at the vehicle. Um, his excuse was his weapon kept malfunctioning, but he had a spare right next to him. He didn't but grab that one. So he didn't follow me over. So I'm basically out there by myself in the wind flapping, you know. And anyways, I, I placed the charge. Um, I could not run back to my ex vehicle because, you know, the engagement was just too close down. I, run, I would have run right into an ambush. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to run up the street to another vehicle waiting down the road. And, uh, but the vehicle that we infilled in was uh, an up-armored uh, Land Cruiser, a $300,000 car. And so I had already placed an IED in the back of it, an incendiary device. I built it, put it back there. And... Uh, what I was going to do is run it back to my original vehicle. I was going to stop, pull the firing system, and we were going to destroy that Land Cruiser. I don't know why they wanted to destroy it, but they didn't want to bring it out the target. The, our mm -hmm. instructions were leave it there and destroy it. So that's what they want. That's what they get. That's what they're paying for. So anyways, I could not get to the, the charge. So the other SEAL, um, he knew that contingency plan was if I don't make it back, he was to run up and fire the system, and he did. And it's all on video. And uh, the first charge goes off and uh, just wrecks the building. Um, apparently vaporizes the bodyguards behind the doors. And then, uh, and then he pulls the other system and then it goes off. And it literally blew that, that car up and literally burned it to the ground. I mean, there was nothing left of it. I was, I was actually in awe that it actually worked as well as it did because it was literally improvised explosive. I never built one like this before. I didn't know... I just kind of made it up as I went, which was kind of cool. I used, uh, right for this, I used, Net, I used Nest Cafe coffee grounds in a jar, uh, half, a, half a liter, uh, half a bottle of gasoline and a quarter block of C4. I cobbled this freaking thing together, put it over the gas tank, and I'll be damned if it works, man. We can burn that thing to a crispy critter. Uh, but uh, so we get out. We get out of the mission. And then... Uh, and so all of us were given rank. So the question is, okay, you know, for everybody out there is listening, oh, my God, being a mercenary is illegal. <laughs> now, I've heard all the bullshit. All right, just shut up. All right, let me just explain what happened here. All right, first of all, it is not illegal to work as a mercenary. Okay, you can go to the State Department website. You as an American citizen can work for foreign country, okay, a foreign government, as long as that government – their policies are in alignment with U.S. policy, okay? The Emiratis are friends of Americans, okay? We're fighting the same global war on terrorism. Boom, all right? There it is. Two, you can join their military, and guess what? They assigned us ranks. They gave us all rank. Guess who the leading, the rankingest, current, the rankingest guy there was AG, made him a full bird colonel. He's in charge of the entire Arab forward operating base. He's in charge of the Arabs. And, he just, and guess what? He's Jewish. Yeah. Guy's Jewish. He's a Jewish colonel in their military, giving them orders. So we get back to the to the compound, and uh, you know, fucking, you know, plugging holes and stuff. And and uh, AG comes back a few minutes later. He's got a thumb drive. He went to the drone pilot. He goes, "I'm the colonel. Give me a copy of that that drone village." And he got it. And the reason he got it is for insurance. So it can never be said that we're out there as a bunch of renegades on our own, right? You know, doing this kind of shit. We got proof right here. For, it came out of your helicopter. You know, here's the, here's the footage, right? So it, it was a smart move, man. Um, you know, it, like I said, it was insurance. Um, so then what happens is basically, okay, we're not sure if we got the target or not because the next day on the news, the local news, um, his assistant was all wrapped up, you know, and he's on the news going, hi, nah, 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 boo, boo, you didn't get us, you know, but he's all fucked up. And the other guys are vaporized. And so we don't know what happened to the principal. And uh, we were told he did get away, and he went back to Saudi Arabia, which I kind of doubt that because the Saudis wanted him dead too. So why would you come back to Saudi Arabia, right? right. So, 
he basically dropped off the map. We're not sure what happened. Maybe he went into hiding. You know, maybe I scared the shit out of him, you know, and he decided he wants some more part of it. I don't know. But uh, so we we go back to, uh, um, we end up in Abu Dhabi. We meet with the the, um, the client. And uh, basically, we're doing an AAR after action report. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he was happy. And so the contract, if I remember right, the contract was worth $880 million. Okay. The first mission was $800,000. Okay, the first mission was a vetting mission. If we were successful, we would get the rest of the contract. And that's why it was important that I was on the first mission. Right. Because it had, it had to go, right? I tell you right now, had I not been there, they would have fucked up the charges. They didn't know how to build them. They wouldn't have been effective at all. They wouldn't have known how to use half the weapon system. You know, they would have had to go to the MRI and go, hey, can you show us how to, you know, work this gun? You know, well, that's what I'm paying you for. So none of that was going to work. So that's why I realized, okay, there's my value. Right. That's why they had to have me, right? So, you know, we got, you know, awarded the rest of the contract. And then, uh, and then we had, you know, the follow-on, follow-on missions after that. So um, anyways, that happened. And then uh, finally I ended up, uh, I ended up walking out of the desert. Me and one of the seals had enough because the one seal that's in charge, I'm not even going to make it.